Tonight, we pause our usual discussions to honor and remember a figure whose life and legacy have left an indelible mark on the heart and soul of the Bahamas. On March 27th, the nation was shaken to its core by the tragic and untimely passing of Donald Saunders, the deputy chairman of the Free National Movement and former deputy House Speaker, who was killed in Gambier Village. Don Saunders was a titan, not just in the political arena, but in every community he touched and in every life he inspired. His contributions went far beyond the walls of governance, weaving a legacy of dedication, compassion, and unwavering commitment for the betterment of his country and its people. Tonight we remember Don not just as a political leader, but as a brother, a friend, a community advocate, and a true son of the Bahamas. We will hear from those who knew him best, who worked alongside him, who shared in his dreams and his struggles, and who witnessed firsthand the passion and zeal with which he served his nation. As we pay tribute to the life and legacy of Don Saunders tonight, we turn our focus to two individuals who shared a unique and enduring bond with him, a bond forged in the shared experiences of brotherhood and ambition. I am happy to welcome tonight Anthony Musgrove, known to us as Tinny, and Father D'Angelo Bow, brothers of the late Don Saunders. Gentlemen, welcome to On the Record. First of all, my condolences. Um, in our opening, I refer to you as his brothers. Um, explain to us that relationship. I think the public, um, in many ways, is learning about more about Don, unfortunately, due to his untimely death. But talk about how is it that you all formed this brotherhood? Well, for us, Jerome, um, firstly, we want to say um, thank you to the nation for expressing their feelings towards Don and his call to servicehood. Um, for us as a family, we really appreciate the words shared and the expression of appreciation for those who offer themselves for service. And we would also like to extend appreciation to the Royal Bahamas Police Force for the commitment and dedication that they have made to fighting crime in the country and for us personally and for our nation for the resources and attention and bringing resolution to this um, senseless matter that took place on the 27th. Um, the next stage for us, obviously, is for um, conclusion in the um, courts of the Bahamas. But for us, the Brotherhood started a while back. Uh, Archdeacon Keith Cartwright, he is one who believes in service, and he gave his entire life to the church and also to the country. He, over the span of his lifetime, brought 33 of us together from differing backgrounds. It started in, ex firstly, it started in Grand Bahama with uh, our late brother, Randall Gardner, who passed away from COVID during the um, pandemic mm -hmm. we faced. And then father moved to Exuma and countless of us got together. We lived amongst ourselves, moved to Grand Bahama and others came. We have shared so much together as brothers, 33 of us. And I recall, Don and I always laughed about it, how Bishop Michael Eldon, late Bishop of the Anglican Church would say that, oh, Father is trying to take over the church. And <laughs> <laughs> our brother Father Bo is an example. <laughs> and then Bishop would end it and say, Tinny Dawn, 
Father's also trying to take over the state. <laughs> and <laughs> Dawn answered the call. But Father instilled in us all a life of service. And we have all paid our dues through service throughout this country in the church, building churches throughout this country, in Exuma, many churches and community halls, in Grand Bahama, in Ragged Island, in Long Island, in Crooked Island. And so all a life of service. And how, uh, Father Boy, I'm going to come to you now. How, you know, did you um, begin to, how, how did you fit into this? Um, while these uh, men took a, a different path, you followed Father and went into, went into ministry. But yeah. how is it you all managed to maintain this bond of friendship that started as boys? Um, well, the key to it was always Father. Uh, wherever he was, we were there with him. From the very beginning, I was just sharing with uh, some friends since Dawn's passing uh, how no matter what he did or where he went, he ensured that we were with him. Uh, in Grand Bahama, um, Antony and Dawn would come home from school along with our brother Desmond, Javon, Lex, Nardo, the whole crew of us, Angelo, um, Lando, Kendall, Mars, there's so many of us. But on Sunday, no matter what everyone was doing, on Sunday we all Eight. After church, uh, we were there for Sunday lunch. When it was time for vacation, he took us and with him. We traveled. We saw the length and breadth of the Bahamas in terms of the church, every island um, we were exposed to. And, and then just moving here to New Providence when he became rector of St. Christopher's uh, out there for some 23 years. Every occasion was celebrated. Yesterday was Father's birthday. And so, you know, all of this makes it so much more difficult for us as a family because uh, yesterday would have been one of those occasions in celebration of his birthday because he is a strict observer of all of the church's seasons. And you know, his birthday normally fell in Lent, which so meant no, he, no celebration. No celebration. Until after Easter until, Monday. Uh, so we yeah. would always celebrate his birthday after Easter right. um, once Lent was finished. But this was the first year in a long time, in quite some time, that his birthday actually fell out of Lent after Easter, which was yesterday, the 3rd of April. And so we were all looking forward to another occasion where we would have been able to come together as brothers because since his assignment is in Agnes, uh, it has been, you know. That's another show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what kind of uh, what kind of individual was Don um, within the group? I think most of us know him in his political life, and when I mean us, I mean the public knows him, um, and in his his professional life. But I want to talk about the the individual that you all knew from that group. Well, Don, obviously, you know, his political, um, and that was the, one of the key things about him where he believed in service through the political arena and which to help with the democracy of our country, the two-party system was vibrant. And he bought that when we were together. He stood fast and strong in his beliefs in politics. And it was about telling his stories and whenever he go anywhere, he would relate that to us. Don would, is someone who loved to express himself. He found it very easy with us to sit down, we, we, we would debate issues and topical issues. We would um, sit down and at the end of the day, we would all laugh, talk and hug and kiss each other because we were so united, our families, our children, you know. We might not be related in blood, but there is nobody, no one who is stronger and closer than the bond that we have. In Exuma, they used to call us Father Boys. Yeah. Okay. And the concept behind Father Boys was because once you see one providing some service, the entire crew would fall in line and they would provide that service. So for Dawn, it was very easy. We looked forward to it. And, you know, Father Bo talked about us getting together. Um, we did that regularly. We did it Sundays. We did it through the week. And this, honestly, this week would have been one of the weeks that we were looking forward to spending time together because Dawn would then come and tell us what is happening within the country. You know, he had his pulse on what is happening. Dawn was one who, in his political alliance, he supported Dion folks. When that race was settled, he supported Hubert Ingram. When there was the race with, at another stage, he supported Hubert Minnes wholeheartedly, and he did it all through his. When it was with Michael Pintard, he supported 100%. 
Dawn was one of the most loyal people I have ever come across, and he brought that loyalty to the brotherhood and to the family. You saw the same thing? Yeah, um, it was demonstrated a few, about a month or so ago. Uh, I had to travel for work, as our clergy conference was in Grand Bahama, and my son plays for St. John's on the basketball team, and Dawn, I had to miss the first championship game due to uh, the clergy conference in Grand Bahama. And that night after we won the first game and my wife sent me a, a photo, a video. And in the video was Dawn at my son's game celebrating with the team because Kamani was playing in the championship game. He ensured that he was there and he was in the stands. Like he would do at Carifta for swimming with Dawn Dawn, mm -hmm. beating a drum. He took some kids, one of the boys um, drums from school and Dawn was in there celebrating with Kamani and his team, just beating drum, which he loved. And then he could attest to this, Dawn could not sit down to a table without beating on the table. <laughs> like, it, it was like, Chonkanu just was in Damn his him. veins. Like, we'd be like, Dawn, like, why you beat, everything you gotta beat on, you know what I mean? So he was there to celebrate. And for me, one of the greatest memories I have of him is Link to Tinney. Uh, the two of them, their desire for service in politics and in nation building, uh, they would always, I mean, always just push each other. Uh, it was always constant battles, and, and and the thing about it was that, like like Tinny was would be this thorn just agitating Dawn. Iron and, sharpens and, iron. Yeah. <laughs> but just seeking to get him um, to push him beyond what he thought he was even capable of, and, and the two of them shared a very special bond from we were very young, and and, and they were inseparable. And mm -hmm. so I know for him at this time among us as brothers. Um, it is a very challenging time for all of us because like Dawn was just so special among us. Um, he never gave up. He was relentless. Which is, which brings me to my next question because knowing what I know of politics, once you have served in a particular uh, administration or for a particular time and that season is over, people leave, they get out, but Dawn stayed. He, mm. he, he remained, um, as much as he could in frontline politics, even taking up a position within the party. After many would have said, you know what? I, I, many people don't tell me what they had to say, I'm moving on. But he, he stayed and he remained active. I mean, and even in our, in this own space, we, we were trying to get him on a few weeks ago, but he had a conflict. But he wanted to come on because he, he stayed in the fight. And, and, and had a great sacrifice to his family. When I say sacrifice in terms of materially, you know, most persons, when they go off the school and they get a newly minted degree, and for Dawn, several degrees. Dawn had the good fortune of um, being educated at major universities. Mm -hmm. And he took that minted degree, and instead of following the path of many who go that route of making money first, mm -hmm. and then after they've made the money, then what else do I do? Let me seek political Let office. Me politics, Let me get yeah. power. But Dawn didn't do that. Dawn's entire life was service. Like my brother, father, um, D'Angelo said, um, when Dawn's daughter was in track, she participated in Grift a few years ago. Dawn was a track dad. His son, Dawn Dawn, who just competed at Grift, is a swimming person. Dawn became a swim dad. Mm -hmm. In spite of all of that, Dawn was, found himself in court, doing a lot of pro bono work for free for free, regardless of your political affiliation. Dawn still found time to do f and business, still found time to do talk shows. He was the main mouthpiece since the f and has been in opposition. I didn't want to say that, but I, yes. that's what I was alluding to. He, he stayed in and continued when others retreated. And, and that is what is needed for the two-party system to work efficiently. In fact, Dawn and I, Father Boy, you recall when we were at our function with Father, we were um, dissecting the by-election in Grand Bahama. And Dawn's takeaway was what got to him was that persons were telling him, let's don't waste time going to that house because that person is known to be a PLP. Yeah. And Dawn's point was, no, I have a message to spread, the f and message. They must hear it. If they make a decision that is contrary to what I believe, but at least they heard that message. And he spoke to persons who were involved in the campaign and said, no, everyone is entitling, entitled to hearing the FNM message. And Dawn lived that. 
Dawn went across this country and he talk show. He was on another talk show the other day and I said, Dawn showed, Dawn, the host is a supporter of the PLP. <laughs> the guest is a supporter of the PLP. Why are you going in that war snare? Like, what are you doing there? For I, you? By the, and I have to admit, and the host play displayed no neutrality. I saw, I would see him in these spaces and I would say the same thing. Dawn, why would you put yourself in, in the middle of real. that triangle? Yeah. But, he, but he was fearless to me in, in, in his message. And that is what is needed to ensure that democracy yeah. believe, stays alive. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just want to interject here to say that one of the key things that get missed in all of this, and, and Tinny just alluded to it, and it was on my mind in coming on the show, was the personal sacrifice that families pay for a Donald Saunders to be done. Mm -hmm. To be who he was in service to nationhood, it, it meant tremendous sacrifice for his wife, Tiffany, uh, for Dawn to be out there, a lot of understanding, uh, a lot of sacrificing of personal time for her and her children, away from home, a lot of long hours on the campaign trail or just out there pushing the philosophy and the message of his party of choice or his personal beliefs, what, is, what was in best interest of our country. And I, I don't want that to be missed in the midst of this, that anyone called to public office, it comes at a great cost. Mm -hmm. It comes at a, sometimes at a devastating cost that you miss out. And Don tried his very best. I can tell you, sometimes we, I'd be like, Don, you need to slow down. And it's because he was ensuring that he was there for Don Don in the pool. He was there for Danielle when she was on the track. And we heard it during Carifta. Uh, that just passed, that from a lot of other swim parents, that he was missed because he was present. That was one thing that he, he made sure that he, he did, but it came even at his own personal sacrifice of his, at times, own well-being and own health. And Dawn gave everything uh, to his family and to this country. And I know that because I could remember on a, an occasion seeing Dawn Tinney and both of them when they came home from summers at university, uh, they used to work at the Port Authority. And I could remember, because I used to eye in for them, they used to bribe me to eye in their clothes. Uh, and I was always to make my little, my little side money, you know, I used, to, I used to tax them to eye in their clothes. And I, I saw Dawn one day, we were out, and Dawn was wearing a tie and a jacket as a prominent lawyer that I remembered from he was a, a college student that he still had and still utilize, and, and it was all because he gave everything to everyone else. Wow, very poignant point. Gentlemen, we are, we, we are coming to the end of the segment, but I do want to um, use these last few minutes to talk about really what his death is, has meant to you and how it has affected you. Um, and what do you hope um, will come out of this? Because I always say that in every tragedy, there has to be a silver lining, there must be a silver lining. Um, so, Tinny, I'll start with you. Well, firstly, you know, this has been one of the hardest blows ever. And the reason why is because Dawn was finally finding himself. He felt that his contribution was being valued, being a trained political scientist. And he was making the contribution he wanted to make. And it's not only about politics, but that is what brings us to this space, talking about Dawn because of his political involvement. And on that merit, you know, Father Bo being a priest, I know he knows that we can all learn something from a Jehovah Witness, a Rasta, that we can use to make our church better. And I know Dawn would want us, um, the political organization that he affiliated with, to understand that politics is about people. The church is about people. You can be the best government, but remember, politics is about people. He wants his party to recognize the involvement and contribution that people make and reward them accordingly. And I'm not talking about in a corrupt manner. I'm talking about rewarding them to give them the prominence that they deserve. So I think that what we can learn from Dawn is to realize that service comes with a cause, but at the end of the day, those who pay the price like we all want after this life to spend eternity with Jesus, treat people with respect. Father, in an instance like this, people will question why this happened to someone like him. And you, I mean, make you put on your father heart now, how do you 
How do you get people to rationalize in their minds a tragedy of this magnitude and take something away from it at the end of the day, not just the sadness and the grief and the loss, but how do we rationalize and then take away from this? Um, the sad truth of this, Jerome, is that we are now reaping the fruits of our labor or lack thereof in the sense that there are not enough key card rights in this country mm -hmm. who are seeing it as their responsibility uh, to impact lives in a way to teach morality, to teach ethics, to teach godly principles and standards. When you talk about, uh, and he was criticized much of his life for taking us on. As Tinny said, we were known as father boys and um, directory boys, and, and it came with a lot of negative connotations um, as we were young men growing up, what people meant by that. Mm -hmm. But it was because of his uh, principles and his belief that by changing the course of our lives, we could have been anything on this road and contributed into a life of crime and violence. But because he found it necessary to instill the right kind of principles and values in us, you have an Anthony Mushgrove, you have a Donald Saunders who became a national figure in seeking to be a nation builder. You have a D'Angelo Bo, you have a Randall Gardner, you have a Kendall Williams, you have a Lando Morley, all who are young, who are men who are now contributing, have families that um, live under one roof. We're not scattered all over the place and we have a true concept of family life and love and service. But we have lost our way. The fabric of building a strong nation is family life. Mm -hmm. And the family structure in our country has um, disintegrated over the past, whether we say 40 years, 50 years in this country, which has been our foundation. And we have strayed away from God and we have strayed away from the church. I was on another talk show last week and we are callers and people texting and saying that the church has failed. And a lot of times this criticism comes from people who don't affiliate themselves with any religious institution, whether it be Christian, Muslim, Rastafarian, whatever. But when I, and I told them on the show, and I'll end with this, when I see a Donald Saunders, it tells me that the church has not failed. When I see an Anthony Mushgrove, it tells me that the church has not failed. When I see a D'Angelo Bow, it tells me that the church has not failed because if it had not been for a Keith Cartwright supported by the church, mm -hmm. none of us. Good place, and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, for coming on, and I know it's a difficult time for you. Continue to have our condolences and prayers, and certainly the nation um, is mourning with you today. But when we come back, we welcome a familiar face as he shares the insight for the political and even investigative aspect of this tragedy. You're watching On the Record. Stay with us. Good week. Well, the news of Don's death sent shockwaves across the country, sparking a national period of mourning. The country has not seen the murder of a political figure since Housing Minister Chuck Virgil in 1997. Our next guest shared a different kind of bond with the late Don Saunders, one in the halls of politics and public service. We welcome the former Minister of National Security, Marvin Dames. Welcome back to On the Record, sir. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's it, always a pleasure. It's been a while since we've had you here to talk. Uh, hopefully, we, you know, it's always better to have people under better circumstances, but yeah. here we are. First of all, I, I want to begin with discussing sort of your, your political relationship with Don and what he was like in Parliament at the time. He served as Deputy Speaker during your time in, yeah. in Parliament. But tell us who Don the political figure was. Don was a great guy. Very, very determined and relentless. Uh, it just so happened that he and I were MPs in adjacent communities, mm -hmm. right? He was in Tall Pines. And Tall Pines, a part of Tall Pines was, was Stapleton Gardens. And um, I was in Mount Moriah, uh, which served the other part of Stapleton Gardens. And so we worked closely together. 
and he was always determined, always pressing to do better. And that's what I admired of him. Uh, when he assumed the uh, deputy speaker's post, and I remember the conversation that I had with him, and what he told me was that, you know, I mean, he wasn't just satisfied with just being the deputy speaker. He wanted to serve, and he wanted to serve at his best. So he looked for opportunities to improve himself so that once he got the opportunity to sit in that chair, he was at his best. And I always admired and commended him uh, for doing just that. Um, and another place the, after politics, when we uh, lost the election, we went into our, our, our private businesses. And it so happened that his office was less than a minute from mine. And so we got an opportunity to talk a lot. Uh, and Don was always someone who was always determined to do better, always determined to improve himself, always spoke about his family, mm -hmm. his kids, and, and how well they were doing. You know, I, I, I admired him and his tenacity, um, and very, very strong in the FNM. Mm -hmm. And he gave his life to it and always looked at, you know, how can I represent my party to the best of my ability? And how can I be the best that I can be? Um, a superhuman being. He, he took on the role of deputy speaker, which is, you know, in the scheme of things, not a very, very prominent role. You sit in whenever the speaker is not there yeah. or at particular times in the proceedings. But he, even though he had that role, he tried to elevate that every time he sat in that chair and he came there um, always prepared and always wanting to elevate the role yeah. of the speaker. Yes, and looking for opportunities. You know, uh, again, you know, he wanted to just not sit in that seat and just just to be a figure, just to say that, you know, I'm going to hold space, mm -hmm. all right? Oh, I'm going to hold serve. But he looked for opportunities outside of the Bahamas, all right, uh, to improve himself. So that once he got that opportunity or the opportunity was afforded to him, he really performed. And you, you could see it every time he got that opportunity. And there were many times, even when I got up on my feet to speak and when there were, you know, um, sometimes little friction within the parliament. The back and forth, yeah. he did He did a great job in maintaining order. Uh, but he under, also understood the rules. Mm -hmm. Right. And he talked about you know, improving the position. Right. Making, you know, giving the, the position what it deserved. And, and he really pressed for that in meetings uh, whenever he had the opportunity to speak. You know, whenever we were in meetings, you, you know, one voice you were always going to hear was Don's mm -hmm. because, you know, he was never afraid to really speak his mind. And that's what we need more of. I was about to say in, in, in politics, politics today, in politics, that can be right? a very hard thing. Of course, you can. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, once you're true to yourself, and, and and that's what I admired of him. And you don't find very many people like that in politics. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sometimes persons are very reserved because they're more concerned about how is this going to affect me moving forward. The backlash, right? Mm -hmm. That was not done, and I admired him for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He also, you know, did something that uh, a lot of people don't do. You know, when you, when you suffer a defeat, he remained. Oh yeah. He remained at the forefront oh, yeah. of politics. Oh, yeah. He never, he never stopped. That's it. He believed. He believed. If he believed in something, he followed it straight through. And you, mm -hmm. you would have heard all of the comments. Uh, mm -hmm. Heard Brother Musgrove earlier, and, and Father Bull. You know, he. You know, he believed in his church. So he gave this all to his church. He believed in his family. That was first and foremost to him. So he gave it all to his, his family. I, I heard his son uh, um, yesterday. I mean, it, it broke my heart. You know, it broke my heart. But you can see that he instilled in his kids exactly what, what he expected, you know, and what he, what he, what he felt, you know, kids ought to be. Mm -hmm. Or to grow into, uh, he, um, you know, I mean, I admire, I admired him for that. 
a, a rarity um, in, in, in a lot of families nowadays. People do not instill those things no. in, in their kids. No. One of the reasons that we brought you on the show uh, also is to speak to um, really what this means for us as a nation. As I said in the beginning, the last time we had um, someone uh, or, or a situation even near to this was in February of 1997 when right. then Housing Minister Chuck Virgil was killed. It was during an election campaign um, and he was brutally murdered. You at the time were... Uh, part of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. Yes, yes. What does something like this mean for our country? He didn't just die. He wasn't in an accident, but he was brutally murdered. Talking Don Sanders was brutally murdered in a robbery. Yeah. A, a politician, a sitting politician, who still has an affiliation with his party and by all accounts is still heavily involved, a deputy speaker is murdered. What are... The, what does that mean for us? What, what are the connotations for that? I mean, from a, from a global perspective now. Yeah. Is what, what, is what he represented. Um, he was a prominent figure uh, in, in, in our society. And uh, whenever you experience uh, a murder like this, um, it gives you, uh, not that it's different from any other murder, Sure. Uh, because the police will treat them all the same, mm -hmm. all right? Um, but it's, it's the public outcry. It's, it's almost like the death of a, of a little child, mm -hmm. all right? Or someone holding some status in, in society, you know, because it w is what, it's, what it represents. Uh, it's not so much Dawn as an individual, but the, the office he once held. And uh, when people see that, it gives them pause, right? And say, what is going on? Where are the boundaries, if, if, if they ought to be, right? Um, and where are we headed as a, as a nation, right? And so it's usually, for the police, it's like we have a home, another homicide, and we need to, we need to focus on this. Like, like every other, and you know, once I, when I was in charge of the Central Detective Unit, uh, you know, we had, we had a, a, a blotter, a big board, where we post every homicide. And every homicide was just one, you know, no homicide was separate from the other, mm -hmm. right? Because the, whenever, it, whenever it, it, it came down to reporting, you know, you wanted to know what's the, position on each and every one of them. But when you have a homicide like this of someone that's known, that's been out there, right? People wanna, people, it, it brings everyone attention to it, full circle. Mm -hmm. what, what's going on? And what we ought to be doing? Take right? us back to that period, and if in, in your mind there are any similarities between what was happening then versus what's happening now. I remember as a young reporter covering that, I remember what that period was like. And it felt almost as if it was a game changer for us when that yeah. happened. And I said for us, for us as a country and as a nation. And I remember sort of the the, the anxiety that people yeah. felt in that period. Yeah, yeah. And when you look at at uh, uh, Don's uh, murder and you look at Chuck Virgil's, I mean, there were, there were some striking similarities, right? I mean, you, you're talking about young men. Mm -hmm. Uh, and young men armed with firearms, um, preying on unsuspected victims. All right, so it speaks to a bigger problem in our society, the one that we must really seriously come to grips with and, and uh, look for uh, really meaningful ways to address these issues that, uh, that confronts us. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, again, like I said, it's another prominent figure. I was not involved directly in the um, Chuck Virgil's investigation in uh, 1997. I was not in uh, the Central Detective Unit at, at the time, uh, but former uh, Chief Superintendent Douglas Hanna, a mm -hmm. tremendous investigator. Uh, and the way he handled that with his team, uh, you know, was was amazing. I mean, he, was, uh, he and his team were 
were able to bring that to, um, to closure. Um, but another prominent figure that I was involved with was uh, Archdeacon William Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, complete oversight of, of that particular matter. And, and I recalled, you know, how uh, we as a team, as an organization, had to really uh, come together to bring that matter to, to, to a closure. Which, which brings me to another question. How do you, or what are some of the challenges that you face um, in trying to solve um, these uh, high profile uh, murders? Because, you know, every murder is, is one too many. But yeah. when now you have the glare of the public and, and the emotions of a community and the outcries now all coming to bear, and if you could use, I guess, both of those examples, what are the, what are the challenges that you think the, the force is facing right now with this investigation? Well, well it's uh, that you, you have a matter, usually in most homicides, you know, probably within, uh, you know, there's a show called 48 Hours, mm -hmm. I believe it is, mm -hmm. within the first... 48 hours or week, mm -hmm. you know, things start to fade away. Uh, but when you're dealing with a prominent uh, figure, uh, that's a little different, uh, right? Or if you're dealing with a, um, a gruesome homicide that really catches the attention of the public, uh, something, for example, of a homicide involving a, a child, mm -hmm. right, or an elderly person. Uh, some vulnerable uh, individual. But when you have a homicide or a murder that really catches the attention of the entire nation, it's a little different for, for, for the, the investigators. It's more Be pressure? It's, well, the pressure is more external mm. because you have that external pressure. You have, I mean, obviously every newspaper you open uh, there's some article uh, on it, or every time you turn on the television, um, there's some press, uh, some news story on mm -hmm. it. And, and then you're hearing it, especially in the era of social media. You're seeing all of these things, and people are giving their comments, right? Whether they're attacking, or what's going on, or what are the police doing? That's the external pressure, right? Now, internally, investigators know that, yeah, we have this murder, which is, which is recent, and it has captured the public's attention, and we know we need to be focusing on this. But we also have a, a, a list of other unsolved murders too, that we these need folks. to be focusing on. Right. So there has to be a, a delicate balance as to how you approach it. Mm -hmm. And you've been driven to by, 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 by the evidence and the information that you're getting out there. So as long as that is hot, all right, and as long as you're driving, you have to keep pushing, because you know the last thing you want is for something to keep, I mean, to be protracted, mm -hmm. and then you run into a situation now of where the pressure is turned up even more. The, the, I'm going to ask you: Is the key really though to capturing the suspects? Is that uh, of course? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's always the key mm -hmm. of, is, is capturing the suspect, because remember. Uh, you know, you have a murder on the loose. A murderer is on the loose, and no telling, you know, again, we go back to motive, and then what is the motive behind this? And if you say then that, well, you know, if this is a domestic matter, you know how to deal with it, square mm -hmm. front. But if you're dealing with a motive, for example, like an armed robbery, then chances are that individual or those individual may not be done. And the question would be, what were they involved with prior to that? All right, uh, because if they're out to rob, chances uh, they're gonna, gonna they're continue. gonna they're gonna continue. And so you you basically have to look at now we got these individuals on the loose, and we have to to do as much as we can to get them off of the streets before we don't have another homicide. It's tough. Marvin names. unfortunately we're out of time. Any closing comments from you though? No, I know we started I just, out you know, talking I mean, about Don. Cert yeah. Certainly, I mean, this is, this is tragic uh, uh, for, for all of us, for our nation. Uh, every homicide is, or murder is, as a matter of fact. And for us as a, as a party, and I'm certainly, I know you, you're gonna have the leader on very mm -hmm. shortly who will speak to that. 
but certainly on behalf of, of my family, my wife, um, I would like to extend uh, a heartfelt uh, condolences to uh, Don's family, mm -hmm. uh, who have been uh, tremendous throughout all of this. I know that his brother, his twin, is in town, and my sister was telling me a story uh, just recently because she has a, a, a young son who um, is receiving a, a treatment for cancer in the U.S. And she was just commenting to me a, a few days ago of how, how accommodating and nice uh, Don's, uh, Dion, I think is his mm -hmm. name, uh, has been to her uh, throughout this process uh, sure it's a, uh, when they travel. It's so, a family. So it yeah, speaks family to thing, yeah. this family and its yeah. makeup. Yeah. Um, and, and they're clearly an example to, to all of us. Most definitely. And something that we should, we should look at. And you know, and, having and respect. Yeah. Having to watch, having to have this play out with the family so publicly must also um, add a, a, another level of difficulty for them as well because grieving should always be a private thing but yeah. cannot no, when, cannot. when you have a situation no, like this. Marvin Nix, thank you very much for always a stopping pleasure, by sir. and talking with us. We, always a pleasure. We, we appreciate having you. Um, I know you. you're a busy man. We've been trying to catch up with you for a long time so I've been happy. That, that you made it. Yeah. Wish it was under circumstan yeah. better circumstances, but yeah. the invitation is open. We'll have you back on again Thank sometime you, in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank All you, right. Jerome. Always a pleasure. Thank you, too. So when we come back, we're going to hear from the leader of the Free National Movement, the political organization that Don served with pride. Stay with us. All right. Be good Thank to you, go. Sir. Come on. As we conclude tonight's special tribute to Don Saunders, a beloved brother, friend, and a stalwart of the Bahamas, we turn our attention to a figure who stands at the forefront of the political landscape Don cherished and contributed to so profoundly. It's my privilege to introduce our final guest for the evening, Mr. Michael Pintar, the leader of the opposition Free National Movement, the very party to which Don dedicated his passion, intellect, and remarkable energies as deputy chairman. Uh, Mr. Pindard, first of all, condolences to yourself and the party uh, on Don's passing. I'm going to start with sort of a, a, a personal reflection from you and what Don meant to you as a, as a political colleague and I even say friend um, and a, a, a young Bahamian who really cared about this country. What does this loss mean for you? I think it's very difficult to calculate the impact of Don's passing on our organization and on many of us individually. We met every Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, the senior team, uh, to discuss matters related to the country and, and to the party. And um, uh, Don was uh, an integral part of everything that we, we were planning. He was in, in charge of coordinating the associations in New Providence, all 24 of them. Um, Dawn was in many ways for a lot of us an untitled uh, leader. So when we served in government, Dawn was somebody you could rely on from the back bench to be in parliamentary meetings and raise issues that others would have raised before the meeting. But when the leadership is in the room, uh, they may not address those issues candidly. Dawn never wilted. He put on the agenda those matters that he thought was important uh, to the Bahamian people um, in a way that he saw it because of uh, the fact that Dawn was integrated in mm -hmm. this society at so many levels. And that was important to backbenchers who were um, who didn't make the, all of the key decisions that shaped the agenda of an administration. And I, I, I learned to respect him so much as a leader uh, because he never calculated how he would be personally uh, affected by raising something that's important to so many others. He just, he just raised them, and he was always respectful. Never uh, combative. There was a phrase that he would use, with the greatest respect, with the greatest respect, and he would then put that important point. Even those issues that were uncomfortable. Of course, of course. And, and, and so my respect uh, for him 
um, skyrocketed just watching him and listening to him engage. And then on a personal level, um, we loved Don because he loved people. Uh, it wasn't about him. Um, there were so many uh, positions that he would have easily filled and distinguished himself and strengthened the profile of our organization and our delivery of services uh, that he was, um, didn't have access to. And while he would let you know, I'm aware of, of uh, some deficiencies you're going to have because I'm not in that place, he always served. It did not impact the, uh, the consistency with which he helped us do the work on behalf of the Bahamian people. And uh, in his legal practice, Dawn just helped so many persons and there was no bill. I'm, I'm learning that There, now, there yeah. was no bill. Um, so personally, if, even if I were not a friend, uh, but just a colleague, I have an obligation to make sure that his children, his wife, that if there is an emergency matter, if there is a need, that, that I and others contribute. Because many of us benefited from his generosity and he never, he never sought to get anything for, for himself. What are the implications of his death, of his murder? If, if he had passed away from an illness, or, you know, I, I think it would, it would have taken on a different, a different life, so to speak. But he was brutally murdered in a violent, in, 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 he was brutally murdered in a violent act and an active politician. What are the implications? One of, one of the, the sad um, lessons is that no Bahamian is exempt from, from violence. Uh, we've had leaders of the country who were victims of home invasions. We have had other prominent, powerful, uh, in terms of state power, uh, Bahamians who have uh, been murdered. We lost, we lost Jack Virgil. We lost Father Willie Thompson. We lost Nurse Lund. We lost persons who you would have expected in a country that is reflective, that we would have moved to borrow a term, heaven and earth, to fix some of the, the systemic problems that we have to save our young people, to positively uh, direct them so that young boys who fell in the arms of teachers who waited at, for them on the finish line of races, did not strike fear in the hearts of those teachers years later. We thought that after those deaths, we would do everything possible to fix what has happened in this country. This is another occasion where you're hoping, where you're praying that people would have a resolve that, listen, I have to do my part. If I'm a business person, what community project on the preventative side I could contribute. If, if I'm a faith-based organization, how do I come out of the walls and I go into the toughest areas for longer periods of time to disrupt the, the criminal uh, behavior? I, I, you know, I use the term that if you're doing a singspiration on the dope spot, chances of being able to, to, to sell the dope or rent a gun, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, it's not gonna happen mm -hmm. while, while you're there. Um, the policy makers would, would say, listen, Let's try to bury the hatchet and figure out a way that we could work together on, on what is a common problem because none of us are exempt. The, the criminal often isn't checking. In fact, some of the criminals don't even know who the policymakers are. And, and so how do we find a way to close ranks on something that is now common to all of us? It lays bare this notion that it's only gangsters killing gangsters. We knew before that that's, that's not the story, that's not the total story. Mm -hmm. is, is it a significant part of it? Yes, but there are many deaths. There's uh, domestic violence, people who said they loved each other, killing each other. Um, there are persons who are caught in the crossfire, in a car, on a highway, being killed while somebody else was the intended target. All of us have a common problem and we have to get away from the public relations spin on what's happening, what's happening is we are losing a lot of our children and young adults who are making life and death decisions that's creating havoc in our homes, in our communities, and increasingly in our schools. 
And all of us have a role to play. None of us are blameless, but we have to now fix it. What is, I mean, you've spoken to really the role of the business person, the community, the church, but it is always ultimately the lawmakers that we look to for direction. What needs to be the posture and the positioning um, and even the behavior of our politicians now, in the now, those who, whether you serve in government or in opposition, because you're all politicians, what needs to be done now? What can you all or should you all be doing now to begin to, to, to halt, slow down, turn around this, what I call to be this disease that's taken our country? It is inexcusable if there's a, any member of parliament that does not have programs in his or her community that can help with the prevention of crime, that can positively redirect or direct the energies and talents of our young people uh, in ways that they are building a country. Because the reality uh, is these guys didn't just wake up the no. day before and decide to go and, and, and rob and shoot. We, that we didn't just them. start. The society collectively groomed them. And sometimes we groom them by neglect. And so if you don't have a program that can get those persons who are culturally talented or in athletics or academically to make sure that they reach their potential, you are then leaving them for the gangsters. And the gangsters could be white collar or blue collar to recruit them to continue uh, um, a, a life of crime that can result in their debt or, or others being victims uh, at their hands. And so we all have an obligation as policymakers in our constituency to do the work to, uh, to reach our, our young people. Within the um, executive branch of government, if you meet with church leaders or business community, what are the specific programs you are asking them to partner with you on? It can't be that we all must do more. You have to be specific about, can we jointly build community centers so that the recreation spot is not in the back of somebody's yard over some libations and a blunt or something harder, um, but it's about can we get some folks to build community centers throughout the country, parks that are not male specific, that only men go there, but that Grammy is prepared to come out, that you trust your toddlers to be in that same space along with others. So there, we have to create some, some spaces that but are But how do you take, the, and you, you, you mentioned something interesting, um, that every member of parliament should have something within their community. But how do you do that and take the politics out of it? Because the reality is, if I didn't vote for you, I may not be interested in coming out to something that you're doing and, or and that your party correct. is doing. Correct, and that is precisely why when you are elected, if you are being sensible, and more importantly, if you're being nationalistic and patriotic, you're gonna serve all the people. And a part of the problem we have is where we are in our history right now, Jerome, we are too tribalistic in the politics. One of the things I'm we well, see- I'm happy you, you admitted that, because that is very true. It, it, and it is a problem. You want persons from any political party to be comfortable coming to the constituency office, because it isn't your political law, it is the constituency office so that they can have a need met or an issue that they expect you to raise on their behalf. And so as policymakers, one of the things we have to do in this moment is decide, we're serving all of our people. And, and so we're not going to narrow the opportunities to one group so that you have marginalized folks who believe they have to uh, find other ways to generate revenue. Um, and, and some of those ways may not be uh, legal ways. Uh, so we have to pass laws that respond to, and in some cases, head off um, consequences that, that will come if we don't do certain things. So it can't be legislation for optics to say, well, we brought it to parliament. Is it enacted is the question. And are we enforcing those laws that are on the books? So if we're gonna bring legislation as is forecasted relative to gangs, does it have the requisite teeth? Are we working with the agencies in charge of in, in enforcement to make sure that the law is carried out regardless of whose cell number that guy on the street have that may sit in, 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 in the parliament. And so, so yes, there's a big role, I think, for lawmakers in, in, us, in, in us helping. I wanna bring our discussion back to, to Don, because really the show is about him in so many ways, but it's, his legacy is marked by his passion for public service, which we have resonated throughout the show. How will the party be working 
to honor his memory and to continue his work in service to the country? Well, we know Don was committed to uh, youth development. Don, 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 his, his son, obviously, all of us have, have seen the inspirational swim um, just yesterday. And um, his, his daughter, an outstanding and elite athlete. Um, so one of the things that, that, that's important to us is promoting his love for athletics and the fact that in his personal life, he was committed. And if you listen to persons from the Aquatics Federation, I mean, you know, Don was committed to sports development, to that particular area, but to all young people succeeding. And if you heard him, he loved his children, he loved his wife. And so one of the ways we're going to pay tribute uh, to him is really celebrating his contribution to young people and being there um, for his family as well. The second thing is, Dawn was so proud of the work he did to lobby for the transformation of the landfill. He was relentless. And that was one of the issues he raised. If he felt the approach that was being taken was in the appropriate one, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't have to go and find him to consult him. Mm -hmm. He was there telling you, this is the posture that we ought to be taking. He was big on recreational spaces, which is why he was involved in developing parks in his constituency. Um, so one way to pay tribute is to do the work that he gave his life for. Um, um, certainly, I would be at the forefront of, of, of making sure we establish a scholarship. At, at UB, you know, he served um, in several capacities at the College of the Bahamas, now UB. And it would be, I think, a, a, a one part of what should be multiple tributes to him um, through UB is to establish a, a scholarship fund in his, in his memory. Um, the party itself, uh, we've benefited from if you ask Dawn to travel to any island in the Bahamas, even though he's responsible for New Providence, Dawn, once he gets his, um, his slip signed at home, he's on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, you know, he, he, is, he is ready to do the work. And so mm -hmm. we, are, we are going to, again, in the new generation of candidates, the new generation of policymakers, point to his model. His model was, while I have expectations that I'm fully integrated, even if I'm not personally integrated, I'm going to support the cause. And that's, that's very rare in politics nowadays. We've got to wrap up, but I do want to say one of the things that stood out to me very early on in this conversation. It said no matter who was the leader, he was loyal. Oh, he question. was loyal to the cause. No, and no I question. think sometimes we miss that. Of course. And that, we and get that, caught up in the leader. Exactly. Dawn, Dawn saw Bahamians first. His, his brother tells such a touching story that... There were opportunities for Dawn overseas. And Dawn kept saying, my fight is right here in the Bahamas. We can make it happen. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he, loved, he loved this country. He loved his family. He was active in church. And he was accomplished. Rise from humble beginnings to excel. He, in many ways, is a model of what we would want our children to aspire uh, to be. Yes, and unfortunately, it took this tragedy, I think, for, for the country to realize that. But I hope, like so many others, that... At the end of the day, when this is all, you know, as, as we reflect and everybody deals with their grief in their own way, that as a nation, we look to him as a model of, of what, you know, a, a Bahamian in service is like. Because unfortunately, people get into to, to service for so many different reasons. Correct. But he got into it, um, from my perspective, for love of country and wanting to do best. Michael Bindad. Thank you for this thank opportunity. You. My wife um, uh, is the godmother for Dawn's um, eldest child, and she's okay. grieving with the family. We yeah. want to let them know publicly and privately how much we love them, and we'll be there uh, for them. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you for taking the time and coming and uh, sharing those reflections with us and, and really looking at this, this tragedy um, in, in a larger context and through a greater lens. So thank you so much for that. Well, we honored a man whose life's work has left an indelible mark on our nation. Don Saunders may have left us too soon, but his legacy will guide us for generations to come. We extend our heartfelt thanks to our guests tonight who shared a close bond with him and provided us with intimate insights into his life, work, and unwavering commitment to the Bahamas. We offer, of course, our deepest condolences to Don's family, friends, and loved ones. To our audience, thank you once again for being with us tonight and may we all strive to live by the example set by one Donald Saunders. If you're watching On the Record, we'll see you next week.